Hello everyone and welcome to today's FICA. Uh, the sun's shining here in Stratford-on-Avon. I hope it is for you as well. And uh, this is our final instalment of our spring trilogy um, on inclusive landscapes. I don't know if you've caught the previous two, but do watch them on catch up if you have a particular interest in this. And today we're talking again about SDG 10, reduced inequalities and target 10.2. Uh, which is by 2030 to empower and promote the social, economic and political inclusion of all, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion or economic or other status. And this is a really important topic for us at Vestra, as I'm sure you're aware. We've identified it uh, more recently as one of the three cornerstones of our 2050 business strategy. And today we're being joined by three experts on the subject for a conversation about both the unconscious and conscious exclusion, I think we can sum it up like that, of young people, particularly that scourge of society, skateboarders, and uh, girls particularly as well, from our parks and open spaces. And Stuart is from another Norwegian company, Batong Park. He's going to share his expertise on the design and management of skate parks. And Susanna and Imogen from Make Space for Girls will discuss why girls simply don't visit our open spaces and parks in the numbers they ideally would, um, particularly skate parks. And uh, this is vital if we're to address society's need to get more people and particularly teens exercising out there. It's a really topical subject and I know you're going to leave enlightened today about this important aspect of inclusion in our society. So welcome to Stuart, Susanna and Imogen. I'm Romy, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the commercial director here in the UK for Vestra. I should just mention that we're recording this webinar for catch up purposes. And please add uh, your thoughts to the chat and your questions to the Q&A tabs. Um, just to get you started, we have a question here. What spaces made you, sorry, made the most impact on you as a young person? Um, we'd really love to hear your thoughts on that. Mine, um, slightly worryingly and bizarrely, I'll, I'll get you started. I was sort of brought up in the Fens in, um, near Spalding, a very flat place. Uh, I, I feel like that's why I have a very strong affinity with the Netherlands. Um, and my childhood was mostly spent in fields, uh, building houses out of straw bales when they were small enough to pick up not the great big things you see now we had a pet goat um so we used to drag that around after us and to be quite honest i think i would be described as feral um but it, anyway it made me into the person i am today so that's got you started let's hear let's hear from you uh and just a little bit more background on sdg 10.2 um, as I mentioned, it's to reduce inequalities. Uh, that's both within and among countries, and these persist across the world. We might think that here in the UK, we're less affected than in many other countries, and, and actually in many ways we are. But inequality around this subject particularly threatens long-term social and economic development and destroys people's sense of fulfillment and self-worth. Self -worth. And if you think about that in, with our young people in mind, that's, that's awful. Um, and we can't achieve sustainable, sustainable development and make the planet better for all if anyone is excluded from the chance of a better life. Um, equality can and should be achieved, but political, economic and social policies need to be universal and pay particular attention to the needs of disadvantaged and marginalised communities, including young people. And the impact on them um, and the fallout from not having welcoming and embracing outdoor spaces is enormous in today's society. So um, I'll get cracking, I think, and uh, we're going to start with Stuart's thoughts on, on this. Um, so I'll stop sharing and allow him to start. Over to you, Stu. Hello, everyone. Morning. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else can speak, but... <laughs> I'll speak for them. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I'll get started. So thanks, Romy, for having us. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining. My name is Stuart. I am the development manager here at Tong Park. Um, we are a specialist design and construction firm that make skatable spaces, skate parks, sculptures, 
and everything in between, really. Um, we do major international scale skate parks, as well as tiny um, single elements um, like this one that you can see here, actually. Um, this is at Somerset House taken last year. Um, this is the first time ever that skateboarding has been allowed in the courtyard. Um, and we kind of, it was with an exhibition that we launched there. And uh, this is my friend Helena skating. Uh, we have a, we kind of cast this balustrade um, in the form of this. And I think this, this photo illustrates kind of how we are trying to be abrasive to the kind of status quo within skate parks and, and where we are allowed to be. Um, and I'll kind of get more into detail on that. So before I go on, um, skateboarding was born in the 1960s and 70s in the West Coast of America to kind of uh, mimic the surfing that was done um, with the same community. And it's very much the same kind of shape um, that we instill in our skate parks today. And the other side of skateboarding is street skateboarding. So the, the photograph on the left is from Barcelona, recognized by many as kind of the mecca of street skateboarding. Uh, these forms are often um, very different. It's kind of this plaza style street skateboarding. Um, large open spaces can be quite difficult. Um, I myself prefer transitions and ramps and bowls, um, but everyone has their own kind of take on, on what they want to skate. Um, the places that inspire me um, is Copenhagen. This is Israel Platz on the left and Superkiln on the right. These are two spaces with skateboarding in mind and, and the kind of use for diverse communities. I was actually at this space last week. I went on a little skate trip to Copenhagen uh, and I was, this building here is actually, um, houses badminton courts and a radio station and they throw parties. And I was at a party in this space at about 11 o'clock um, last Thursday and there were people playing basketball. There was a group of young skaters using it still. Um, so it very much is a space that is successful in its objectives of, of having use all hours of the day. Um, and it's a, it's a strange courtyard, this in Copenhagen, because usually um, courtyards are overlooked quite a lot and this one isn't. So there was a danger of antisocial behavior, but actually it's been very, very successful. Um, and on the left, similarly, is Israel Plads. Um, very much explicitly designed for beginner friendly. Um, these heights are very small, the radiuses are very mellow, um, and it's, as you can see here, kind of very, very well used. Pushing borders. This is a photo that I think captures a step change in skateboarding culture. Um, so as well as being working for Batong Park, um, I'm the campaign director for Longland South Bank and one of the co-founders of this conference, which is called Pushing Borders, that we've done in London and, uh, and Malmo. And this was the kind of amazing, beautiful community of people that came together for a week in Sweden to discuss um, how skateboarding can be more inclusive, how we can be better allies and how we can kind of create a, a safer space um, around the world. And it's, it's really important to, we spent most of our budget on flying in people from South America, from Africa, from Australia to, to try and make sure that it wasn't so much of an echo chamber. Cause I think that is one thing that can be quite challenging is that everyone's patting each other on the back when, when really we do need to be critical and have that um, academic eye, which leads me to my next slide. Um, which is some some data. When we were having a practice session for this, we were talking about the, the need for data. Um, and when I'm applying for funding, we're making the case for councils for, for the use of skate parks that always want to see evidence. So I'm just going to go through um, a few studies. The first being um, 2020 from the University of Southern California, which in a survey of 5,000 respondents, 57% um, stated that they skateboarded purely to be creative and express themselves with the other 53 saying it was in order to meet up with friends and 70% were doing it just in order to have fun and 70 another question uh, was led that mainly it was because traditional team sports by age 13 just simply weren't fun anymore um, Wood Carter Martin 2014 and Morgan and well 2014 stated that it was very successful in encouraging positive goal settings, independence, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, developing social skills, empathy, cooperation, self-regulation, and impulse control. I actually think that that impulse control and self-regulation is really, really important. Um, if you 
follow development studies, that kind of agency um, for young people is, is really, really important and something that is misconstrued now that, that we live in a world of social media. So that this kind of like tactile self-regulation um, in our urban spaces, I think is, is really, really significant. Um, Clark, 2012, and Pecha, 2007. This is a really good study for um, explicitly gender diversity within our design process. Um, talking about the kind of exclusive nature of traditional sports clubs against this um, this active girlhood was was the term that they used about maintaining that active girlhood well into adulthood, um, which has been adopted as a key kind of objective by UK Sport and Sport England. Uh, finally, Lisa Woods University of Western Australia, 2014, um, that stated that of a survey of 400 skate parks, uh, it was mainly a, a diversionary focus away from antisocial behaviour. Um, with positive associations with other kind of social norms. So there are lots more studies like this, but these are the kind of four ones that I thought spoke quite well. And again, more data. South Bank, the oldest skate spot in the UK. I won't go into all the detail because it's very long and uh, contested, but we opened up the space again in 2019. And as part of our funding from the London Marathon Charitable Trust, we hired a evaluator called Flow. They're very good. I'd recommend them. Um, and they collected a lot of data about the space. This has been followed up by subsequent research, um, which I'm yet to be able to share, but this has never actually been shared with the public um, so far. So it was a lot of time spent there and 152 skaters were interviewed to get this data. Um, first and foremost, it was a very diverse space, 48% um, being non-white or British. Um, almost doubled the use of females before and after the refurbishment. As you can see here, it's a lot of work to be done with only 15% of female users. I think one of the reasons for this is simply because South Bank as a space is quite challenging to skate. One of the reasons I don't skate there very much is because it's very difficult. It's kind of less easy to have fun there, which is why immediately after creating the extension, which was a kind of lower impact bank, it doubled in six months, which is really, really positive. And we hope that this can, this trend continues and that um, by the next time we do this, it will be 30% at least. Importantly, people come there quite a lot. Skateboarding is, um, you know, it's something that we actively do, you know, as much as we can once a week at South Bank. Um, and again, very important that this was, you know, people doing this to have fun and, and that can't be forgotten. Life shouldn't be so serious all the time. Um, young people need to feel like they have an outlet for their energy. Um, and people were brought in from all around London to be there, um, predominantly kind of South London, but also every other area. So moving back on to Patong Park's work, this is a really amazing project that we did with the city of Westminster and Vans last year in the Strand couldn't really be more central. Um, and this was 19 days. And over the 19 days, we had over 2000 people come. Um, and this, this speaks well to the idea of programming, especially for, for women and, and young girls, is we worked with a company called um, Neighborhood Skate Club that ran a session that had over 50 people come and attend. Um, and the importance of, of having female-led sessions is, is really significant. When I organize our skate schools, I make sure that it's 50-50 split of our instructors. Um, the response that we've had before is that women are much more likely to engage in our sessions if it's being led by other women, um, which was a kind of a light bulb moment for me a few years ago, but I guess shouldn't have been. Um, but now it's something that we always make sure and we're kind of doing that across all of our programming now to make sure that it's not led by me. It's actually there's more ownership of the women that are using the space as, as well as running it. Just some photos from the Strand that I think are really quite striking. Uh, it's, it was beautiful to have it there. Shame it's gone. The, this obstacle is actually now in place at another DIY park. Um, and this is sat in a warehouse in Piccadilly. So if anyone wants to buy it or have it, let me know. It's uh, burning a hole in Westminster Council's storage unit, I think at the moment. Um, design development. We can't really talk about inclusive design um, unless we touch on the process that us as designers go through. This is indicative of our first stage. We always map out the site and try and think about how the spaces interact with one another. And this is always based off our consultation. We do pre-app consultation 
more than we should in terms of our resources, but we feel it's very significant to, to having an end product that matches what the people that are going to use it need. Um, this was actually a project that we just finished in Ware in Hertfordshire, uh, where the users wanted this flow section um, and also a street section, but there'd be a danger of kind of collision. So we needed to make a kind of buffer space and, and then a tarmac area with a walkway. Um, and then the kind of other young people wanted a, a more beginner friendly section over here. So we kind of have to make sure that we're including all of these young people's voices right at this early concept development stage, which then goes into something like this, which is a slightly more advanced concept sketch. This is actually of a project in the north of Norway called Andenes, very famous whale watching spots. So we've, this is actually kind of based on some whale forms and there's a fin going on there. Um, but again, this, this is so important for us to work with landscape architects as soon as possible. Because if we're brought in last, there's that, um, that phrase, the last thing added is the first thing cut. Um, and it is definitely true within skate park design and creating spaces for, you know, balance play, for barbecues, for street basketball, for hangouts, um, you know, this, making sure that the, the wind direction is affecting how we sit in the landscape. Um, so, you know, if, if we create a space for young people that doesn't consider these things and it isn't used, what's the point? This is public money we are you know at their beck and call essentially so yeah it really has to be as inclusive a design process as possible if you're going to create these spaces um, that are democratically designed very quick one again on city mill this is a, a project we're working with um, the ucl and a few academics this is the first time this has ever been shown i submitted this for planning last week um, so these forms here are six individual elements that were designed by young people at a series of workshops over the last few years this is a photo of our drawing desk last week. Um, so we, we ran these sessions and it was nice to put the power in, in young people's hands, um, saved me a job, <laughs> as well as, you know, giving them a sense of, of kind of ownership over this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, so this was one of the workshops we had. So we, we kind of went down and did a skate school and then walked them around the Olympic Park where they would eventually go and then built up some obstacles. And you can kind of see this was actually the obstacle that one of um, the users wanted to design and then we ended up building it in our workshop and everyone skated it. Uh, this is uh, this is our designer here who designed it. And then this is her skating it. And I, I love this photo. Um, and then this was earlier in the day with another one of our users who was like modeling something else. So it's, it's kind of bringing the design process front and center and, and allowing these young people to feel like they're creating it and it's not just us. And this is completely different to our usual bread and butter tender process with with local councils that kind of give us a design brief we go away and do it um all very straightforward but you know this side of our design is is kind of much more exciting much more challenging the status quo like i said which is which is where we want to be inclusive design isn't just about young people and women it's about adaptive skateboarders it's about wcmx users it's about visually impaired users something that we're doing a lot of research on at the minute is creating obstacles that cater to visually impaired skateboarders and wheelchair users um, it can be as simple as making sure the radiuses and heights match the wheels and also for adaptive skateboarders and um, visually impaired skateboarders it's producing saw cuts that are indicative of the space up to an obstacle, as well as things like making sure the length is long enough so that they can feel it on the cane before. Usually our ledges are like grind boxes that we install are about three meters, but for visually impaired skaters, it's better to be you know eight, 10, 15 meters so they can really have a sense of when it's coming and when it's leaving. Um, we are trying to develop design codes alongside USA Skateboarding but it's, it's quite difficult, um, but it's something that we're really trying to press ahead with and wanted to touch on that. It's, you know, there are lots of other users of these spaces that want to feel included in the design and the end product, which can sometimes look something like this, which is a school in Lakagata in Oslo, um, which is one of my favorite projects that we've ever done. And one of our most like, critically acclaimed over the years. Um, this is it again, at street level. It's for a school, so again, very beginner friendly, all these bumps and lumps and burns. And yeah, just a, a really beautiful product that has been extremely well received and actually is kind of the center point of the girl skate scene in Oslo. And um, this is kind of where everyone meets up and, and has borne out many, many friendships, events. And uh, yeah, my colleagues in Norway 
this is their home for for women skateboarding in the city and it's it's really great that we were part of this process of, of creating it bringing it closer to home this is hackney bumps down the road from me um, this was a community project that Baton Park were involved in uh, over 1500 man hours of volunteer sanding and like diamond grinding um, to get this. You can see the line here at uh, the surface coming back. Um, this has spawned, in my opinion, the most inclusive and friendly skateboard community in the whole of London, which sometimes can be quite it's some of the skaters I, I talk to and, and skate with aren't that nice, I'll, I'll have to admit, but this is a community that is, you know, insanely um, welcoming to us. And as part of that, we do new builds. So it's, it's an old skate park, but we, we build new things there. And um, this was an element that we've just finished. And it was part of a creative process where we put out a kind of public call out for designs, had a bunch of sketches come in. Then as a team of designers, we kind of formed them all together and then did a co-build, which looks like this. Um, so it's, again, it's not just about us thinking about including people and it's not just about including them in the design. It's also about including them in the construction process. Um, concrete is difficult, it's hard work. And so like the more hands make light work and it, it can be quite busy, but it's really important to, to again, have that sense of um, ownership over these spaces. And again, it really does lead to this skill development. Some of the guys and girls that we have had on site now work for us um, and we've run workshops in the past this is actually one in nottingham recently where we kind of upskill these young people about how to use power tools how to set formwork how to shape concrete um, and then some of them have gone into the industry um, in other ways and then on other trades and have cited these as, as part of their cv development and career development um, and that's time for me i think so thank you very much and i'm sure i'll talk more later i can't believe you did that Stu. i was literally about to send you a message just saying we need to move on shortly that's perfect timing yeah yeah excellent uh much appreciated um if you could stop sharing your screen we'll bring in Susanna and imogen um but that was fascinating thank you even though i've seen and heard quite a bit of that before um it, it's just so interesting to see you know, expertise in an area I know literally nothing about. So are you ready, uh, Imogen? I think you're sharing the screen. Yeah. Perfect. Let me just go to the beginning. Ooh. Yeah. That's it. Lovely. Does that all make sense? Did you use the shortcut? I did use the shortcut. Excellent. So right. I'm the Stuart. <laughs> who has introduced <laughs> me to a new shortcut, everybody. We That's share IT party. skills on Fika as well. So I'm going now, I'll leave you to it. Thanks. Well, well, thank you first, Fika, very much for inviting us to this presentation. And thank you, Stuart, um, for that presentation, which I thought was amazing. And I think what's so exciting is seeing how people's passion can really act as an influence for making spaces more inclusive. And that's really what we're about at Make Space for Girls. We're a charity and we're campaigning to make our parks, recs, playing fields, meanwhile spaces, all those spaces as welcoming to teenage girls as they are to teenage boys. And so we're, we're trying to get people to think about these spaces differently, trying something new, which is always scary. You know, let's be honest, trying something new is scary and really starting conversations early and engaging with the, the voices that we don't often hear. We would say that when it comes to public parks, there is a problem as far as teenage girls are concerned, because when we think about teenage provision and we look at play strategies, space strategies for councils all across the UK, you find that teen provision is skate parks, multi-use games areas, BMX tracks, and sometimes there's a shelter thrown in. And although these are seen as teen provision, when you actually look at what's going on on the ground, they're almost always dominated by boys, which is not to say you don't see the odd girl there. You may do, but they're generally dominated by boys. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Design of places, as Stuart has just talked about, design is really critical for making people feel welcome in the space. 
There is the behaviour of boys, and that is something that we have to tackle, we have to recognise and address. And there are also issues around the expectations placed on girls and the time that they're allowed to play, and indeed whether they are allowed to play. And what we say is that we need to fix these problems, we need to fix these things. We shouldn't just try and fix the girls, but often what we hear is, oh, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with the kit that we've built. The kit that we've built is absolutely fine. We just need to make the girls use it, really, if we give them lessons or tell them they need to put on football kit and play football. If we fix the girls and change the girls, we can keep doing the same stuff we've always done and it'll all be fine. And our position is actually the girls are kind of okay. They don't actually need fixing. What we've got to do is change our approach to how we create and animate these spaces. Teenage play, um, we're quite bad in the UK of recognising teenage play. We're at a, um, a council meeting and there was an almost visceral shudder when we started talking about making spaces that would attract teenagers. You know, there was a real fear with people essentially saying, oh, you know, we just don't want to attract teenagers because we'll attract antisocial behaviour. And there's this sort of synonymity between antisocial behaviour and teenagers. We've got to get over this. Skate parks. Skate parks are a really important part of teenage provision. I think that's something that, that we all need to recognise. Not just because of the thing, but also it's a signal. It is something that says that teenagers are welcome. But there is a problem if we think that the skateboard park is a sign that all teenagers are welcome. Because if we look at the stats, what we see, and these are figures from Skateboard GB, 85% of skateboarders are male. And what is happening on skate parks all over the UK is that boys are driving girls away through the way that they behave. There's a really amazing book here called Skateboarding and Femininity by Dani Abulawa. And she recounts the story, she's in Platfield Skate Park in Manchester, group of young lads, 12 to 16, skating around, having a good time. And um, a car pulls up and um, one of the boys shouts to the other boy, oh look, your bitch has arrived. Now, Danny, who was there, wasn't having any of that. So she stood up and said, you don't say that. That's not appropriate. And what she records is how taken aback the young boy was by being challenged because he saw the skate park as a place, quite rightly, where he was welcome, but also where he was not used to being challenged. Skate culture, particularly online skate culture, can be quite alienating towards uh, women and girls. There are people doing really amazing work to try and change this culture and change this dynamic. And the work that Stuart is doing through Pushing Borders, the creation of the Role Models, which is a tremendous programme. You know, there's some really good work being done here, but we're kind of at the bottom of quite a big mountain at the moment when it comes to making outdoor skate parks welcoming to girls. Some interesting US research there. They stuck activity trackers on teenage girls and they saw that actually living near a skate park lowered the amount of exercise taken. But look, it's not all negative. We can improve things and better design really does improve inclusivity. And I've just put up there, the credit for that photograph is Rebecca Rubin, who is uh, from White Architecture in Sweden. And that was a skate park design, a theoretical skate park design that they produced through talking to non-normative skateboarders. And this was the, these were all the ideas that they brought to the table. And I know that, you know, Stuart and his team are right at the forefront of developing these alternative ideas, breaking up space, trying to change the model of what we provide for skateboarders in order to make it more inclusive. But I'm gonna pass on to Susanna now, because as I said, we're at the bottom of a mountain here when it comes to changing skateboard culture. And so what else can we do to try and encourage teenage girls to use space? I'm gonna hand over to Susanna. 
Yes, um, because we also, um, lovely to be here, by the way, thank you very much. Um, as well as thinking about making the current facilities work better for girls, we also have to ask what do girls want from space? Because at the moment, because what's provided so often ends up being dominated by big groups of, teen of teenage boys, they can actually act as a deterrent to teenage girls for using the park at all. So we need facilities which act as signs in the way that skate parks do for boys to teenage girls to tell them that they're welcome. We also need less prescriptive areas. Part of the problem for of what's provided with um, at the moment is, and it's not that they shouldn't be there, but we need something else because they're, they're very didactic about what they do. You skateboard on a skate park. There's not a lot else you can do with it. You play football on a pitch. And actually, one of the things that comes back from all teenagers, not just girls, is that they want areas where they can basically just play and just be and mess around. Um, areas that they can interpret as they want and do what they want with. So that's really important. Um, and some of that can be incorporated into the design of skate parks. But as I said, we also need other things as well. And a really key point for us is the public sector equality duty. Um, under the Equality Act 2010, um, councils and any other public bodies have a duty not just to consider equality, but to work to redress, redress discrimination. And we think that the current provision in parks for teenagers is absolutely a key area where this needs to be applied. Next slide, please. Oh. So now the fun stuff. What does better look like? Um, was Stuart not here, we would have also included his their great Norwegian skate park there because that is a way where a skate park can be integrated. It also unusually has areas for beginners, which girls really want, and also flat areas that can be used for other things. Roller skating, which a lot of girls do, doesn't seem to get the airtime that skateboarding does. And so creating spaces that can be used for multiple wheeled sports, including roller skating, is really important. So there's been some other good work done, particularly in Sweden and Vienna. And from this, it's possible to compile some sort of common principles or themes for what works better for girls. Better lighting and circular paths. This is basically safety. Um, safe, if a park doesn't feel safe, girls won't use it, full stop. Circular paths are really important because it means you can swerve trouble. You don't want a dead end path. You want to see what's coming. You want choices about where you're going. Smaller subdivided sports areas. Um, Multi-use games areas, the fenced pitches of many parks, don't make girls feel safe at the moment. They are a fenced, they have a high fence and narrow entrances. They're also a single area, which is really easy, like a skate park, for one group to dominate. But if um, these are broken up, it makes it easier for more than one group to use the space. This is true of parks in general. The more smaller spaces you provide, the more different groups. And this isn't just teenage girls, this is other marginalised groups. This is groups of boys who don't want to play football or skateboard. The more people can use the park. Sociable seating. This is really important for teenage girls who want to face each other while they're talking. So the classic park bench is no good to them in the immortal words of one bit of consultation because it means one of us always has to get a gravelly bum. Even a simple picnic table is better for teenage girls than the straight bench. Hanging around. Um, there's a lot of provision that used to work for teenage girls that for various reasons is disappearing or changing in parks. Swings get smaller, they get fenced in the toddler play area. Girls feel they can't use them because they'll get tutted at by the mothers of small children but they really, really like swings. So let's build some bigger swings. Let's put them outside the fence of the toddler park so that they, and those I think are one of the key ways that we can sign to teenage girls that they're welcome. But also gym bars are not the sort of grown up pull up um, gym equipment ones, but just the kind you can swing over, literally hang around on. Performance spaces are another um, thing that gets requested a lot. Stages, um, places to do dancing, Place, but they can also be a community asset to organise things for girls in the park and crucially good quality toilets, which are really important to teenage girls. Next slide, please. So we're just going to go through a few of these case studies quite quickly. Um, 
the groundbreaking research in this was done in Vienna. Um, they realized that in this, um, it's a very large square, it's not like an English town square at all, in Vienna, the girls were passing through, but they were not stopping. So they put in some simple things like hammocks and again, a, a thing, a wooden thing that can be interpreted. It can be seating, it can be stage, it can be whatever. And they started getting the girls to linger, but they also broke up their pitch, put a divider in it, which again is a, an object that could be a seat, it could be a stage, it could be all sorts of things. And in doing that, they got more girls to use the park. Next slide, please. Moving on from that, well, recently, this was a specific request for by teenage girls for a stage in a square in Vienna. Um, as I said, it's a community asset. It can be used for all sorts of things, for events, um, meetings, whatever. But when it's not being used in a wider sense, the girls use it for performances and that's what they wanted. Next slide, please. This is a great example. It's a park in Malmo that was designed with, for and by a group of teenage girls and young women. Um, and it's the, Malmo had a policy of creating parks in little bits of rundown urban space. So it's not a huge area and it shows you don't need a huge area. But as you can see, there's the, the gym bars there. They wanted a climbing wall. It's been quite subtly broken up into different spaces, so it can't be territorialized by one group. And just off to the left, which you can't see in this picture, there's another stage. Uh, next slide, please. This is great. This is a recent um, park development in Bredang, which is a suburb of Stockholm. And um, it's part, it's the, it just takes up the area of one pitch and it's in an area where there are lots of other pitches, but within that they've created a playful space. It's got a swing, it's got shelter, it's got, but it's also just got stuff that encourages you to be active and play. It's gloriously non-didactic. Um, and uh, I think it's a really great example of what can be done with imagination and not a huge amount of space. Next slide, please. The key to all of this, though, and you'll notice how often I mentioned in the past few examples that this was done after talking to teenage girls. They are not all the same. Location varies in hugely and how they react to location. So you need their views on that particular park because one thing we know from doing consultations, they're absolute experts on the space they live in. But also, if they are telling you that there's a really dodgy entrance that they don't really like going through because um, it's dark and enclosed after four o'clock in the evening, then you can build the most beautiful thing in the park you like, but the girls won't use it. But also intersectionality. Um, there's a huge range of cultural factors which bear down on how girls use parks, whether they're allowed to use parks, what will be acceptable for them to use in parks. So that's really important as well. Um, with that, some thoughts. Don't consult by going, oh, well, we went to the park and asked the users, because mostly the teenage girls aren't there. If you talk to the people who are already using the park, you'll get the same park. We need to go out, and again, this is a more general part, and talk to the people who are not using the parks. Um, talk to them as groups of girls, as well as in a mixed group. Teenage girls have a complicated relationship with teenage boys. Some of them are their friends, potentially they might be boyfriends, they're their classmates, but they're also the strangers who hassle them and make them feel unwelcome. And you will get really different results if you speak to them on their own. Um, the other thing, and this slightly goes back to the first point, is when you're designing specific things, don't just speak to the users. Um, this is a quote from the Skateboard GB guidance. The problem with only talking to the people who already use a skate park is you very rarely get a skate park with a beginner's area because the users, they're already users. They don't want one. Why would they ask for one? So again, you have to go out and reach the people who are not using it. And in the case of skate parks, quite often that's girls who just don't feel welcome. So we're never going to create skate parks that make girls feel welcome unless we're reaching out to the people who are not there. And, you know, the obvious logic, logical point of that is co-production as it's happened in Malmo. What's fascinating about the Malmo co-production is it was designed entirely by teenage girls as a group who found the process enormously empowering but they were working from the basis that uh, in their what they call their sort of free activity areas 
They were dominated 80% by boys. Designing a park just with girls created a park that was used 58% by boys and 42% by girls. At the moment, the dial is so far over to spaces being used by boys that we really have to work hard to get it up to not even quite even. Um, next slide, please. And that's basically us. Uh, we're really happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk to us further about these things. We've got, this is a short introduction to our work. We've got a lot more examples and suggestions and case studies and guidelines for consultation that we exist to share with people. So please do get in touch. Thanks, Susanna and Imogen. Yeah, please do. Um, I can speak for everybody here today. Um, I know that all three would be more than happy to discuss your projects, how to do things better. Um, that is what the FICAs are about, really. It's, it's bringing the SDGs to life and how better than showing case studies and bringing people together that, you know, are making real differences already. Um, so th those were some excellent thoughts. Thank you. Um, I'll just get the slides back up again and uh, we can we can get um, moving on. Um, so I don't know if anybody's got any responses in the chat that they wanted to run through or Q&A. There are some thank yous and I need to just call out Alistair McKinley. If you look on LinkedIn, um, there's an amazing photo of his cinnamon buns from this morning, which I'm a little bit worried that he might be in a diabetic coma. I'm quite glad you've put, you've put something up, Alistair, because I think he's eaten both of them during <laughs> the course of this speaker. So it's good to see you're still about, but uh, obviously he's saying thank you. So I don't know, please do put questions um, into the Q&A if you have any. Um, but I've seen uh, this myself in terms of uh, when I was a green flag judge. I think I spoke to you a little while back about this. Um, I was taken to a park, I think in Stroud, and uh, it was very clear that the people who were showing me around wanted to keep me away from the skate park. And I was shown the Crown Bowls area with, you know, great glee. And uh, it, it's just weird. It's just weird that everything that we provide for young people is, is hidden around the back or tucked away around a corner. And, and one of the key sort of cornerstones of um, Green Flag Awards is that it's a safe and welcoming space and place so they're not getting that right at all I think in in my experience um and also the point of I think asking people involving stakeholders community engagement you have to go seek people out don't you you can't just rely on you know who who you find hanging around the park gates I mean it's it's ridiculous and I've seen that many many times as well which is a bit sad um, I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on what makes them feel safe. I suspect it's a really clear breakdown uh, between men and women, young young girls or boys. Um, but I think all of the points you mentioned, Susanna, they're obviously good lighting, circular paths, things like that. You know, they're, they're pretty clear and pretty easy to um, accomplish, hopefully. Um, but, but you made the, the point you made about the green flag um, judging is really interesting <laughs> because by banishing teenage facilities to the dark corner you mm. immediately make them less accessible to and attractive to teenage girls teenage mm. girls really one of one of the other a part of safety for them is being in an area of pedestrian traffic being mm. amongst people they don't want to see their parents or their parents friends or people they know but they want to be around anonymous people because that's a core part of safety for them um but this, this isn't often, and it's one of the ways that discrimination can happen accidentally. Mm, rather, yeah. you know, it's 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 not thought through, but it is nonetheless a result of what we do. I guess at least that's unconscious, if you if you like. But I mean, what I what I explained earlier when I was mentioning the sort of conscious um, discrimination, you know, the, we've all heard about. I think the mosquito noise being played. I think it's stopped now. I think it was a few years ago, hopefully. But you know, that playing that very high pitched whiny buzz because young people can hear it adults you know older people can't um you know it's got to get you questioning what we're doing hasn't it when when we're doing things like that totally consciously and deliberately to just drive certain people out of certain areas um, a, a, a conversation that i was having with so, someone on a council i said well look you know you said you don't want the teenagers here you don't want them there mm. actually you know at the moment, the only place where your teenagers can go is the chicken shop or McDonald's. Mm. 
And is that yeah. really, you know, in you know, a place like London, which, OK, we're tight on space, but we've mm. got a lot of creativity. We've got a lot of there's a lot of clever brains in this city somewhere. Mm. Really, is the mm. best that we can do for our teenagers when you finish school, the spaces that you can go and you are welcome in McDonald's and the chicken shop. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you tell me that's the best that you can do. Fine, but I don't believe it. I think we can and have to do better mm. for yeah, our, we want, our yeah. teenagers. We wonder think, why there's an ob obesity uh, yeah. problem. You know, and I, th I think there's two other key things. One is that public space is the only place that teenagers have to be autonomous. They are mm. not autonomous at school. They are unlikely to have much autonomy except for maybe in their rooms at home. So how are they going to learn to be independent adults if we mm. don't allow them public space to do that? That's what teenage play is. It's actually negotiating independence. Mm. And the alternative is that they go and do it on their phones. You know, that's yeah, the again, only other yeah. autonomous space. You know, yes. we really, yeah. the second point is that we just judge them in such a different way. Nobody ever complains about old people loitering in the parks, filling up the benches. But mm. teenagers are seen as being problematic simply by being in public space. And basically, we have to get over ourselves a bit. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I think, no, absolutely. I think this, this conversation about safety and risk averseness is something that I'm always having with my clients. Um, mm. And the, 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 the depressing reality is that the knife crime epidemic has put mm local councils and land managers backs against the wall. I was on a call yesterday with LLDC about this uh, city mill project in Stratford, where we, you know, we have a quite a major construction budget. Um, you know, we, we've co-designed these elements. It's all very positive. And the first question I had from their head of land was how can we create a space where knives can't be stored? Mm. And this is off the back of a 20 inch machete getting found in one of our skate parks recently right so yeah for me i'm always trying to put myself in the shoes of these local councils because on one hand yes absolutely um you know open spaces with no lighting should be fine these, these are spaces for people to have this self-actualization that we're talking about to, to develop this quite natural and organic community mm. but the councils are really struggling and there's a kind of a fine line of balance. And I think the best councils, Lambeth is a good example, um, is where they are accepting the risk and kind of putting their cards on the table to say, you know, we're, we're going to take a chance on this and we're going to expend, like, experiment and be different. Mm. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I think, yeah. I think the crucial point, I think there's two, point, two points I want to make here. One is that there is a difference between safety and what feels safe to women. Yeah. And mm. that's, that, I think, is something that maybe is not in the conversation as much as it should be. Because this is that it, a, a skate park which feels, feels safe to women is... I suspect probably quite different. And the second thing is mm. that it's about this, this thing about pushing things to one side. If you integrate skate parks, which is one of the things that would make them more, more accessible to teenage girls, into the wider park space so that they're in busy areas, mm. so that there are there is passing traffic, so that other people are seeing them, so that they are part of the community, not a set aside thing, then you are going some way to solve that problem. Because if you create a space, and this is one, one of the principles of Make Space for Girls, is that yes, we are awful teenage girls, but actually when you create a more inclusive space, everybody benefits. And so a skate park which feels safe to teenage girls is probably going to have a whole lot of mm. other wider benefits. And so maybe you're looking at skatable spaces which are not distinct, which are more integrated into the park. And maybe some skateboarders don't like that as much, but you are then inviting other people in and also massively reducing the risks of this kind of thing happening. 
It's the key yeah. point to universal design, isn't it? That yeah. the most vulnerable people, if it's good for them, it's good for literally everybody. I'm going to have to move on to our question. Sorry, Stu, to cut across you. Maybe you want to answer this one. We talked about, uh, you know, brilliant brains in the city. Maria is here from City of London, so we know she's one. And she's asked, um, how would you suggest we deal with conversations in certain city locations regarding anti-skateboarding measures? which are very unwelcoming, is there scope for incidental skateboarding, i.e. benches, stone planters, etc.? And she's referring specifically to the City of London who view skateboarding negatively. Um, yes, that's why absolutely. I describe them as the scourge for us and our benches. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think one of the first things to touch on, you know, I, I know that the City of London explored skateboarding um, with, sorry, I think somebody's trying to get into my building. So why don't you get that for? <laughs> um, there was an NLA design competition recently with the City of London. One mm. of the briefs of that was to create anti-skateboarding devices, which I thought was fairly archaic in that the City of London, ha on one hand, was looking to integrate uh, skateboarding um, into, into its spaces, which is amazing. Mm. On, the, on the other hand, there were doing these design competitions and still has that bylaw. Um, I think I've actually spoken to some of your colleagues um, in the city of London. I think one of the first steps would be to change that bylaw. Um, it's actually the only place in London where skateboarding is technically, technically still illegal. So mm -hmm. ahead of any design uh, iterations, you know, the, these anti-skateboarding benches, I think we have to address the policy and, and, and the fact that it, there is still a bylaw that says it's, as it's illegal. Um, right. I'm hoping that the new Barbican development um, in, the, in the coming years will integrate skateboarding, but I think we really have to tackle that bylaw issue um, before mm. we can move forward. And I've kind of taken a very hard line um, against that <laughs> with your colleagues, but I'm, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're in favour of um, designing in skateboarding. That makes me really happy. We can definitely I, can get I also, you together. I also think it's worth having a sense of perspective that skateboarding is not the only kid on the block. Mm. That actually, in terms of teenagers, under 8% of, of teenage boys skateboard, 2.3% of teenage girls skateboard. So yeah. it's quite easy to get very focused on, should we allow this, should we not that? But actually, can we also open up the conversation into what other facilities are we providing for the the, 80 something percent of teenagers who don't skateboard. Mm, mm. Yeah, sure. And quickly, girls. sorry, we, yes, no, that's a really good point. We've got one more question from Lucy. I'm just aware I don't want to keep yeah. you all over time. Um, who says, we did a workshop with school counsellors from an infant and junior school this week. They were super creative and had lots of ideas about how to make their current park better. But there was a lot of talk about safety. They wanted CCTV, a phone to call parents or free Wi-Fi, but also a park keeper. Does anyone have experience of where there are regular staff in playgrounds or parks? I think they're often called rangers, aren't they? In some of the parks I've judged with Green Flag, they do have rangers, some of the larger ones. I don't know who wants to answer that one. Well, yeah. there's one one thing is that, um, yes, abs what, yes, absolutely across the board. Um, park rangers are good. Also, adventure playgrounds, staffed adventure playgrounds, mm -hmm have they they are brilliantly equal they are also unusually places where a wide range of um children of different ages will play together without the little ones being fearful of the older ones so mm. yeah if you can get it but it's so hard at the moment yeah I mean, the, the funding the, the only other mm. thing i'd say is that um a lot of parks certainly around northeast London, have started putting up signs basically saying, if you want to be a personal trainer in this park, you need to get a license and you need to pay. Mm. And I say that's insane. Um, the presence of adults, benign adults mm. in a park, is a very positive thing. Personal trainers tend to be young. They tend to be fit. They tend to command a certain amount of respect amongst teenagers and young people. Mm. And having those PTs in a park just as a benign presence, I think is incredibly valuable. I saw yeah. a space down near in Fulham where there was a young PT and he was there most days. And he was an unpaid, informal, 
Connie Youth Worker, really. Yeah, exactly. He lived on the yeah, estate. Yeah. He knew a lot of the kids. The kids always knew he'd be there. Mm. He wasn't a big, you know, swinging his weight around kind of guy, but, you know, he'd sort of shout out if he thought, you know, oh, yeah, you're, something you know, was amiss. Yeah. Something was amiss. And he was just, a, and so I think, I think some perhaps, you know, local authorities are missing a trick here. Don't mm. ban these people. Mm. Welcome no. them. Come yeah. in, run your little mini business here. You yeah. know, because you're a good presence in the park and we should be yeah. encouraging that. Yeah. Stu, did you have a thought on that? I think you were about yeah, to say it, something. Yeah. It's definitely something that we're seeing more of. The one project springs to mind, which isn't actually finished yet, but it's it's got funding. We designed it in Nottingham. It's called Sussex Street. Um, and it goes, I think you mentioned this, Romy, very quickly, but it, it, a lot of it boils down to funding. Um, to have that part of the budget earmarked in very early for revenue funding is so important like if mm. you're building a skate park uh, usually it's at um capital builds kind of funding whereas yeah. um kind of a salary for somebody to be in a space would be part of revenue funding opportunities so this space in nottingham we've we've funded for about three days a week somebody to be there from nine until five to kind of just skate around um, have access to boards and pads and, and make sure people are feeling safe and and mm. when they're stepping on a skateboard to kind of give them some advice but not overly so um so yeah there are definitely some examples but not many this actually spot in sussex street is the only space that i've known which is an outdoor free for use space that has a dedicated member of staff um, that we've got funding for mm. the other kind of response is that in paid indoor skate parks there's of course somebody there but then this this is a part of skateboarding that we actively don't really engage with because i feel mm. like it's wrong to charge for skate parks um, okay yeah but yeah there's this project in sussex street and um, there's an organization called skate nottingham um which is really really inspiring the work that they're doing especially a guy called chris lawton who also works for skateboard gb which is the kind of national governing body mm. He's Ooh, been really... you've... sorry you've reminded me i've got a poll <laughs> Go on, Sorry, hit the poll. Nearly, I know I nearly forgot about that completely right I need to find it Sorry about this uh we're I'm aware we're running over slightly so um I will try to crack on and not hold you up too far can you see that so yes you just reminded me from skateboard GB according to them what percentage of skateboarders are under 18 so you can choose well I would only choose one you can choose more than one but it seems ridiculous so if, if people want to start uh voting on that um oh yeah we've got someone in uh we've got a few more to answer unless everybody's left no you're all still here so be brave we need a few more responses before we can get anything meaningful for this i think from this i think in the meantime uh thank you alistair i don't know how you pronounce it i think it's a phobia a febiphobia fear of youth um every day is a school day <laughs> i've never heard of that but uh thank you for bringing that up that's uh that's really interesting i think we're gonna have to close this one now okay so um it looks like you those of you that voted believe that it's 60 percent. i think we're going to have to ask one of the experts what the actual answer is because i don't know <laughs> according to skateboard gb it's actually 80 percent Oh, ah, okay. It's that still makes me feel very, very old. Much. I, I'm not, Stuart, no, absolutely not. No, that's very that wasn't important. the intent. That was not the intent. You are just very young. That's what it is. Okay. And the next one, if I can if I can get it uh moving on. Um right, let me just see how I bring that one up. I can't find the next question. We may have to um Oh, yeah, you voted on both. Sorry, they both came up at the same time. I'm really sorry. I didn't share the other bit. So, again, what percentage of skateboarders are women and girls? And the most popular is 15%. I think we, yes, I think we had a few clues uh, I mean, there was a, today. There was but... a clue. Yes, we did say that in the presentation. So we're really pleased that everybody was kind yeah, of... Yes. Everyone's awake and listening. Hey. That's, actually, we should do more of this just to yeah. check that. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <I agree. laughs> 
Have you rude. taken in the information? That would yeah. be rude. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, OK, we haven't got very much time now. I think I'm going to have to just close this quickly. If anyone has any more questions or thoughts, please do get in touch. I mean, we're always around, obviously. Um, but I hope this has helped you sort of pin down SDG 10 a little bit more. They are a little bit slippery and intangible. So I think we can all see real ways in which we can make a difference. And that's very much the intent of our FICA series. Um, if you don't want to miss out in future and you're not already on it, please sign up for our newsletter. You'll find it on the About Us page um, and look for something that looks like this. We, we cover all these sorts of subjects quite regularly in our normal newsletter and, uh, and in these FICAs and in everything else that we do, including our social media and particularly Instagram. So that will keep you in touch with what we're up to. Um, and I really hope you've enjoyed today. I know I have. Um, we're taking a little bit of a break. We're going quarterly from now on um, because we are very aware that there's a crowded webinar program out there competing for everyone's attention. So we're going to hold the next one in June. And I think it's going likely to be on neurodivergence. This got sort of set off um, by the last couple of speakers on um, last month with Sam on designing for dementia and the one before with Ross on uh, urban realm and mobility. So uh, we're looking into that and getting some interesting speakers along and we hope you'll make it. And we're very much also hoping to run the September one live from our new factory in Norway, the plus. Mm. Don't I know. I don't know. I mean, it could all go horribly wrong, but that's the plan at the moment. <laughs> and you can catch up with them all through that link. But don't forget these count towards your CPD. We also have formal CPD, including one on inclusive landscapes. If you'd like to um, tune in for any of those, let us know in person or online. Also bear in mind our competition, uh, the three speakers today and the most regular uh, listener will be entered into a competition to take them to the plus next year. So you can see what we do firsthand and uh, we'll report back in the autumn from our first trip with last year's lucky winner. And thank you very much to all of you joining today and particularly also obviously Stu, Susanna, Imogen for your thoughts and expertise. Um, thank you. And also my colleagues, Matt and Jack, who are hidden in the background, keeping me in line. And uh, great. Have a great weekend or go help.